GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your trusted source for useful and legitimate information to remain on the forefront of the internet revolution. I'm Jay Bird, and we believe that Web3 is going to change the world. That's why we're here to guide the world's top talent into this space to contribute, get ahead of the curve, and capitalize on the opportunity. In today's episode, we're exploring digital identities, and why self-custody is the future. And here with us is Tim Boss, the CEO of Sharing. Now, Tim brings over two decades of experience working at both startups and large enterprises, all with a focus on emerging tech. He's held senior roles in organizations such as Microsoft and Accenture, a joint venture between them, Barclays, GE Capital, Atari, and others. He's also built many startups, is first in 2004, where he focused on building a software framework for tracking valuable assets around the globe, blockchain before blockchain existed. Then he most recently founded Sharing, and he'll tell us on today's episode all about founding Sharing and why he decided to focus his life and his career on self-custody of our identities because it is so important to own our data, but also it's fascinating how much Tim talks about the friction that we experience when it comes to our data and our identity. And he talks about identity in more of a holistic sense than not just our digital identity, not just our identity of what we do online, but our identity in terms of our passport, in terms of our driver's license, in terms of our address, in terms of the wider picture of who we are and how we can bring that online and do it in a safe, secure way, and then how we can use that identity in a much more frictionless way when we need to interact with things both online and in real life. There's many use cases that Tim gives today. This is an incredible episode that is really so important at the end of this episode, it's amazing how Tim makes his prediction for 2023. You're going to need to stick around to the end to hear that. But it really shows the importance of understanding digital identity and understanding self-custody and how it's possible on chain. Enjoy today's episode. Before we jump in, let's just take a minute to hear from our sponsor. The future of social media is here, and that future lives in Web3 on top of Lens Protocol. Web2 social platforms are broken and ripe for disruption. You see, the epicenter of social media is the creators, and yet they are the most neglected. Web2 platforms like Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram are all essentially robbing creators of their worth. Creators are a new type of entrepreneur, forming new types of businesses. Yet with Web2 platforms, creators don't own their content or their profiles, and that's their product and business. Instead, they are tied to the platforms they choose to create on. Well, just like how crypto is freeing us from banks, Web3 is freeing us from these centralized platforms. On Lens Protocol, creators own their content, own their profile, and even their social graph and followers in the form of NFTs. This allows you to move freely from one social application to another with your content, profile, and followers moving along with you. Lens Protocol enables self-sovereignty for your social graph and interoperability across the internet. At Web3 Academy, we believe this is the future of social, and that's why we've partnered with Lens to ensure that the path of social media is heading in the right direction. Visit lens.xyz to learn more today. Are you building a community around your brand? Well, listen to this. At Web3 Academy, our motto is community first, profit second. Why? Because engaged communities tell you exactly how to improve your product and ultimately drive growth. They act as team members, recruiting new customers and providing crucial feedback. And they become brand super fans, sticking by you through thick and thin. But to engage your community, you must first understand them. That's where Chasm comes in. Chasm is our go-to Web3 tool for managing and understanding our community members. It combines both on-chain and Web2 metrics all in one user-friendly dashboard. With Chasm, you'll know things like which other communities your members are part of and which of your campaigns are truly driving results. That's why at Web3 Academy, we use Chasm to launch campaigns, optimize growth, engage our community members, and automate workflows with this all-in-one tool. If your community is already on-chain, 
get to know them better with Chasm. Head to chasm.xyz using the link in the description and discover why top brands like Immutable, Nifty Labs, and Colab Land are using Chasm. Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Really excited to have you because today we're talking all about digital identity, self-custody identity, decentralized identity, pick whatever term you want to use, which is such an important topic. I've heard you say before that if you don't own your data, you don't own your identity. Maybe let's use that as an entry point. What does that mean to you? We talk a lot about having custody of your crypto and tokens and don't leave it on the exchanges. And I actually see that as the same about your identity. I mean, your identity contains so much information about you. You know, it's not just your passport or your photo of you or things like that. Your identity is everything about you. And over the last sort of 10 years, we've tended to sort of share so much about ourselves and our information stored on servers like Facebook and Google and things like that. And it's starting to bite us back. I've always taken the view that we should have our own custody of our own information and we should choose who we share it with and not let other companies choose who they share our information with. I love that. It is so important. We've created this world and look, Web2 has given us a lot and a lot of good things and there's been many benefits, but now we're in a position where maybe things need to change. Okay, before we dive deeper into digital identity and what you're building over at SharingRing, let's just take a step back. How did Tim decide to dedicate his life to Web3? How did you fall down the rabbit hole? Wow, that's a big rabbit hole. So back in the 90s, I worked in the video game industry. So I worked for a company making video games. And actually, I started off testing games for them years ago. And then I ended up becoming the general manager for their IT infrastructure. And it was around 1996, so not long after Toy Story came out, 3D intros in games were all the rage, and they needed a way to basically render 3D stuff really, really fast. And obviously, you got these 3D artists, they can't render easily on their mm -hmm. computers. So I created one of the first distributed render farms. And the idea of actually using, say, decentralized technology to sort of compute like really difficult problems really, really appealed to me. And I think we had all the computers in the office plus about 20 computers that we purchased that were just rendering video, create intro sequences for shit. Yeah. For me, it's just this passion for tech. I love diving in and just making stuff. After that, I worked for a few consulting companies. I worked for a Microsoft Accenture joint venture, joined the dark side for a little while. I worked for an investment bank. Around sort of early 2000s, I just sort of thought, I want to do my own thing. Like I'm so passionate about the stuff that I'm doing. I want to go out and do my own thing. So I started my first company called Biowatch, which is a GPS tracking company, initially for animals, but then we started selling vehicles. Sold that around 2008, then started a peer-to-peer -peer caravan sharing business with my wife at the time. Sold that in 2013. It wasn't going very well at all. It sort of needed too much time and effort, that more than what we could actually put into it. Then in around 2013, I started Keys and Keys had the original goal of creating a platform for the sharing economy, like an open-ended platform. And we very, very quickly realized that using Web2 architecture at the time, it just wasn't possible. So we sort of focused just on car sharing. Fast forward to around 2015, I came across the Ethereum white paper and it blew my mind. Like I'd mined Bitcoin before because of, like I loved the whole idea of decentralized computing and stuff. So around 2010, I mined my own Bitcoin on a laptop for about six months. I have no idea what happened to any of that. Um, <laughs> but we're not sort of <laughs> so yeah, don't, don't get me started on that one. When I read the sort of Ethereum white paper, I thought this concept of a distributed virtual machine on mm -hmm. computers all around the world that you don't trust and having sort of these immutable sort of finality of the transaction, I looked at that and thought, we can create these protocols for the sharing economy, and this is going to solve us it's a huge amount of problems. One of our problems with Keys was creating this one-size-fits-all protocol, but also providing this frictionless onboarding process with reusable and self-sovereign digital identity. And that's mm -hmm. sort of where sharing was born. So yeah, 2017 is sort of when the idea with sharing came out. That was sort of me looking at the different things you could do with Ethereum and smart contracts and stuff for a couple of years. And then we sort of landed on sharing in around 2017. So it was driven from more from a need instead of a solution looking for a problem, which is, mm -hmm. I guess, unusual in this space. It sounds like you've pivoted a lot in your work and in your career. This wasn't a question that I was planning to ask, but I've just got to ask, 
this because it's always interesting when somebody has that ability to pivot. Is that natural to you? Is that something you yeah. learn? Where does that come from? It's something that's sort of natural. I guess it's a bit of ADD in me. I see problems and always look for solutions to those problems. In terms of pivoting, I, for me, they've all been stepping stones to where we are today. When you say pivot, sometimes I imagine that's a big left turn and a big right turn. But I actually see that where I am is an evolution of all the stuff that I've done before. So mm. where we started with keys in terms of the base, the core SaaS technology that we created, that evolves perfectly into the caravan sharing stuff, which evolves perfectly into the car sharing stuff, mm -hmm. which the problems that we had then around identity and frictionless access evolved into what we're doing with sharing. So I've got this sort of view that as technology evolves, the possibilities of what we can do with that technology also evolve with it. And we've I've sort of looked at harnessing those possibilities into these new sort of ideas and solutions to big problems. Hey, mm -hmm. That's great. I love that. Okay, before we get into the possibilities of what you're building at Sharing, let's just set some context for digital identity. You talked a little bit about this with the first question I asked and that quote that you've said, but what is digital identity today and what are the problems with it right now? Today, people see digital identity as a digital version of your passport. I see it as much, much more than that. I see it as a digital me. So it's a digital representation of me and who I am. So obviously to access certain services and to go into places or buy certain things, I need to prove something about myself. Mm -hmm. And that's where digital identity comes in. It's, it gives me the ability to prove something about myself either in a Web3 world, a Web2 world, or in real world. And that's what I see sort of digital identity as. And there are sort of some very firm definitions of what digital identity or DI is under sort of W3C standards. Mm -hmm. But I, I personally see that as a lot more than that. I see it as a digital me and something that allows me to do something and make it easier for me to access certain things or prove something about myself in the real world or the virtual world. Right. So it's more broad to identity in general of yeah. things like your driver's license or your passport and using those things the way you would use them in the real world. But right now they're physical and you think about them more in a digital way. Yeah, exactly. And I also sort of feel that we're going on to your next question, where it's broken at the moment, is we're forced to share everything about ourselves to do small things. Mm -hmm. And a very good example of that is here in Australia where I am, if I'm sort of young, I go to 7-Eleven to buy some cigarettes or some alcohol or something like that. I have to show them my ID. And in Australia, your ID contains your full name, your date of birth, your driver's license number, your home address. It contains everything about you. <laughs> so I'm handing this card over to someone that I don't know, that I don't trust, that they can look at it and get all this information about me just to prove that I'm over 18 to be able to buy that alcohol. Mm -hmm. And the same goes to going into clubs and things like that. Or when I'm signing up for a crypto exchange service or something like that, and all they want to know is that I'm not in a certain jurisdiction, that I'm allowed to trade and things like that. But I'm doing a selfie, I'm photographing two forms of ID, like I'm doing all this stuff and just giving away my information. With Apple, I can sort of store all my stuff in my Apple wallet and then they have all my information. <laughs> like. There's just this oversharing of information. It's biting us already. There's some major hacks in Australia with the Optus hack and the Medibank hack where people's passport information, passport numbers, tax file numbers, like all this information has basically been leaked. Mm -hmm. And those companies had no right to hold all of that information. They had to, but they had no right to because they didn't need all of that information. Our mission is really to... A, provide this frictionless access to goods and services, but also whilst maintaining this trust and high level of security and actually ownership and control of your information. It's something that I believe that we're solving. Give us an example of how it would be different and maybe use the example of a young Aussie going to get cigarettes from a convenience store. How could it be different with what we're so, so with sharing? That's a really good example. So if an organization trusted the technology that was developed, right? I could go into this 7-Eleven store, scan a QR code with my phone, and it basically is green light. This person is over 18. I can buy it and take it away. Or maybe I use biometrics like a thumbprint or something like that. So we use like a zero knowledge type of system to be able to prove that I'm over 18 because that's the only question that they're asking. Are you over 18? So I should be able to answer yes and prove that I am through the technology, through this trust that's created with the technology. 
without sharing any information about myself. I don't even need to share my date of birth. I just need to confirm that I'm over 18 because there's trust in this verified identity that's been created. That's a really good extreme example of it. Other examples are a lot of sort of these DeFi lending contracts and things like that. Institutions cannot interact with them because of the counterparty risk associated with them not knowing who they're lending or mm-hmm. borrowing from. We could effectively create, say, a soulbound token that says two things. One, I'm allowed to trade because I'm over 18, or maybe there's an age restriction, or B, I'm not in a sanctioned country. And that allows me to interact with that DeFi platform. So then institutions can suddenly interact with it because they know that everyone that's interacting with it is not from those sanctioned countries. That sort of goes from one physical thing at a 7-Eleven to Web3, and there's everything in between. It's about sharing the minimum amount of data that allows you to gain access to the service that you want to access. Obviously, to achieve this, there's a lot of things that need to be built, a lot of different stakeholders that you need to get on board. How are you getting there? Give us an idea of the sharing sort of ecosystem, the different apps that you get, you have, the vault, a few different things that need to be used in order for all this to happen. Yeah, really good question. So we started the development of this in 2018. And honestly, I didn't realize how hard it would be to solve the big, big problems. And, you know, like I'm happy to say we're finally there. But to break it down in the most basic sense, there's three parties to any of these transactions. One is the party that creates or that issues the identity. So that could be either a government issuing the identity, it could be sharing that's actually verifying the identity on your behalf, a university issuing a graduation certificate. So there's the issuer of the identity. Then there's the user themselves. So the user holds what we call the sharing vault. The vault contains all of your verifiable and verified credentials in it. It's completely self-sovereign. So it's in your phone. You can back it up to a cloud driver or local storage in case you lose your phone and want to swap it. It's encrypted with your public key. So we use asymmetric encryption so that only your private key or seed phrase can decrypt it. And then the third party in this is the receiver of that information. So the technology, we started with obviously the vault and the app that's wrapped around it, blockchain that sits under it, which is a, the Cosmos SDK, and then also the transaction mechanism and the pricing mechanism for the transaction. So all of that sort of stuff we built first. And the latest part that we've built is what we call VQL vault query language. Mm-hmm. So we needed an easy mechanism to be able to get information out of the vault in a secure manner. So we created this idea of a query language that's based on JavaScript. So I can write a query that says, are you over 18? It's a simple yes, no, are you over 18? And then that will generate a QR code. It'll either generate a QR code or if I'm using the SDK, it'll ask the SDK directly. And I can simply put that QR code out there and either put it on a website, which is what we call a dynamic one, or even print it out, put it at a location. Someone scans that, and that's the mechanism for getting information out of the vault. So that, that query language. I can also create a query that says, what's your passport number, first name, last name, email address? Like, what's some specific information about yourself? When I scan that QR code on my app, I'll actually see the information that's being requested, and I can say, yeah, I don't want to share that. Or I can say, yes, okay, we will share that unprint to prove it's me that's sharing it and mm-hmm. then I can share that with that third party. For us, as I said before, the mission for us is about removing friction from these interactions, but also maintaining that trust, security, and ownership of your information. So mm-hmm. through those areas of what we've developed, we've achieved that. And I guess all three of those parties are experiencing friction right now. Just to use the few examples that you gave, it's incredibly costly to manage all this, the security to manage the data, the number of people you need to do something that really doesn't require that much effort to do. There's just so much friction right now. So, okay, how do you get there then? Just quickly on that last comment, an interesting fact. So we've spoken to a few insurance companies. Um, one of them was to get our own insurance. And when they were looking at us as an identity company, they saw that we store nothing about a user. The only thing we store is their email address and their name. That's it. Right. But we don't store anything else. One of the things that they basically said is it's starting to become impossible to insure companies for cyber security risk because of the amount of data that's been stored and because of all the hacks that have been happening recently. Right. So we have companies talking to us now saying, we don't want to store this information. How can we avoid storing this information? So the need is there. Company that don't that information they don't want to store it but they have to be able to prove something about someone to be able to access their services 
So we're seeing this fundamental shift in the narrative from these organizations where information is power and information as an asset to this whole thing about we don't want this stuff. We can't insure it. We want to operate our business without storing all this information. What's the focus to get there? Obviously, when you have multiple users or stakeholders, you have to get them all on board. That's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So how are you approaching that? In the past, we've sort of sometimes fallen for the risk of sort of trying to boil the ocean because there's so many different opportunities. There's a thousand mm -hmm. different things that we could do, a thousand different ways that we could approach this. So effectively, we've got two divisions running within the business. One is what we call sharing foundation, which is the underlying foundation of the blockchain, the vault, the query language and things like that. So the plan for that as we're moving forward now is to create hackathons and incubate different projects and builders building on our blockchain. So builders creating smart contracts that leverage what we've done, builders integrating with the Vault query language and so on. So we'll provide incentives to basically allow people to build on that. The other part division is what we call sharing business solutions. And that's really focused on the digital identity side and the SDK that we've written and actually working with businesses to integrate that SDK, which is the vault into their own systems, into their own apps. We're currently talking to some governments in terms of a digital identity. So digitizing their physical identity and allowing people to use it for various services within that country. And then also a number of organizations that can benefit from what we're doing. So no specific verticals, but mm -hmm. we are sort of finding, you know, great opportunities in the car sharing area, in food mm -hmm. and beverages, alcohol sales, online sales, deliveries and mm -hmm. things like that, finance as well. So that's quite broad in terms of the areas, but in terms of where the sort of horizontal stack that we're focusing on is very much that SDK and the, uh, the digital identity side of things, because that's really our bitch hit to start getting critical mass of people using the system. And... I've heard you talk about events as being a vertical that you focused on. It's one that I find interesting, mainly because I think everybody understands events. When we talk about finance sometimes, finance is a complex industry that a lot of people just don't have the interest in understanding the regulation, quite frankly, and the yeah. governments behind you know why you can or can't invest. So events is more accessible to the majority. Yeah. So can we just chat a bit about what you guys have been doing with events and yeah. how you have seen sharing enhance the user experience of somebody, a, both a user and an event holder? Sure. Yep. So basically, if I'm going to an event, a ticket isn't just enough, right? So I may need to prove that I'm over 18 to be able to access that event, or I may need to sort of give my ID or something like that to, that they scan to go into that event. So obviously the first side, NFTs as event tickets has been, there's a lot of discussion around that. So we spilt that into the vault because we sort of see things like tickets is another thing that is part of you, right? But when we've been speaking to a few number of stadiums and providers of information, the identity site is actually a really big deal to them. And part of the reason why, like there's one use case we were speaking to last week and Basically, they run some of the stadiums that where there's been some incidents of fights and things like that in the stadiums. And one of the problems that they've got is during the event, they have no idea who's in that stadium at all. Mm. So because what happens is someone buys a ticket and they scalp the ticket to someone else and then they sell it to someone else. And they go in with this piece of paper, that piece of paper scanned. They go in, they're sitting in a specific seat and they don't know anything about it. So part of our technology with the vault SDK allows you to import that ticket and then when you scan into that event you can share just enough information about yourself to prove who you are to be able to enter that event and then if there's something that goes wrong or something happens and they need to identify you or something like that they have the ability to do that during the event after the event the information's gone so for them this ability to actually allow for that free sort of sale of tickets and things like that through either physical tickets or NFTs or whatever it is, but also the ability at the point of entry to be able to attach that to some sort of identifiable information or even just proving that you're over 18 or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's bold. That for them reduces the bottlenecks in the queue because at For the moment, sure. a lot of the you'll have hand your ticket over, grab your ID, show yeah. your ID, get your bag searched, scan the ticket at the gate. Like there's these bottlenecks with, you know, these 50,000 people events that are just mm -hmm. unnecessary. So if you could go in and just scan a QR code or have your QR code scanned on the way in and go straight in with no 
additional checks, then that's a big cost saving for these organizations, but also it's a risk reduction for them too. Mm -hmm. And so the organization has the incentive. What about for the user? How do you get the vault on the phone of the user? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it really goes down to that whole control of my information. So the more the narrative moves towards you should have custody of your information, the easier it is for us to start pushing this mission. And people are starting to demand that as well. An interesting fact, when we first launched our app, just as a beta last year, we had, I think it was about an 80% bounce rate. So people went into the app, the first thing they were asked to do was scan their passport. And they basically said, no, I'm not doing that. And they shut the app down. And that's because our messaging wasn't very good in terms of telling them, we're not storing this information. You're doing this to create a or an identity. So we're focusing very much on that narrative to help people understand that this is about them taking control back to themselves. So once we get a few of these pilots and then the rollouts going, we'll start seeing people demand organizations that they start using technology like this. So <laughs> it's about getting that critical mass first through these pilots and proof of concepts and then pushing the narrative to make it reusable. I talk about SDK a lot as well. So one of the things that we've developed is this idea where you can have, say, multiple apps that use the sharing vault installed on a single phone. So they can share the same vault with the same information. So you might have an app from an alcohol delivery company. You might have an app from a banking organization, maybe a government or a stadium app or events app or something like that. All of those can actually share that same singular vault that basically is effectively run by our SDK that we've created. That's something that I haven't seen before because most of them are sort of like, oh, you have to use, say, the sharing app and then access all these things. We're not saying that. We're saying that you'd need to use the vault, which is covered by an SDK, and you can white label your own product on top of it. So interesting. So if you were to talk to a user, and I mean, what's your sales pitch to a user? Okay, why should you take the steps to set up your vault and have self-custody of your data? I think the sales pitch is going to be different for different people. So mm -hmm. some of them, the pitch is going to be easy because a company that we've partnered with or that is using our SDK needs them to use it to get started, right? So... Once they've got it installed because they're using company XYZ, then the pitch to them is you can use this in so many more places. Mm -hmm. And then, then we incentivize them to, well, basically start pushing for companies to accept it and things like that. But I think overall, the narrative is about taking back control, taking control of your information, taking control of your data. This whole concept of self-sovereign has been floating around for so long. But as I said, really, at the start of this discussion, we talk about custody of, you know, take custody of your crypto, take custody of your money, be your own, an owner of that. So we should be following the same idea for our identity as well. We shouldn't be giving away all of the information about us because it will come back to bite us. It has already come back to bite us in so many different occasions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not only in the way that it could be hacked and stolen, but also in the way that it's we're currently used as the product in so many of these major social media websites that we use, we are sold for advertising dollars and yeah. that we have no control over that. We have no choice. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Sometimes we slam web two and social media a little bit too hard because look, like mm -hmm. they provided an incredible service to us. We've all been to connect. We've been able to share photos, do things that we couldn't do yeah. before. And they had to make money in yeah. order to build the great UX and the great UI they have. So there is benefit, but it's gone a little bit too far. Where do you see this going when we have control of our data? Well, maybe take us out 10 years from now where self-custody is the thing. What does that look like from a user standpoint in terms of the way we interact online and interact digitally? I think for that, having self-custody shouldn't make things harder for you. So we actually see in the future that this is genuinely a way to remove friction. How many times have you gone to check into a hotel and you've had to fill out the forms and hand your passport over and wait in a queue and all of that? So there's bottlenecks everywhere because we have to keep filling forms out. We have to keep giving information about ourselves away. I've talked about Google before about storing so much information, but even they don't want to store too much information about you in terms of the central information. They don't store a photo of your passport or driver's license. So 
It even means when I sign up for a service and I use my Google login to sign up for that service, I still have to enter all this information about myself and sign and my passport. That's friction, right? So self-custody of that information where it's completely portable should also be able to remove, allow me to remove friction from any of my daily interactions. I should be able to scan a QR code on the car windscreen for a company I've never used before. They get just enough information to be able to trust me. When I go to the 7-Eleven, I should be able to just sort of tap something or scan something and it proves that I'm over 18. So I think the future for self-custody of your identity is all about removing that friction. So you're creating this trust, safety, and security of your ID, but you're also removing that friction. And if our solution isn't removing friction, then we haven't done what we set out to do. When you say it like that, it sounds so simple. It's so desirable. Oh, well, that's the idea, right? The underlying tech, there's a huge amount that's gone into it. Like it's hard. It's really hard. But our goal is to make it so that the user experience is as simple as possible. It's as simple as scanning a code or putting your thumbprint on something or scanning your face and that's it. I don't want to dive too deep into the underlying tech, but let's, since you bring it up, and I do think it is important to understand so first tell us how are documents stored within the share ring vault what how does that storage work within the vault the first thing that we do is let's say you're onboarding an id so you use an id what you're asked to do is take a photo of it and then for this particular one i've got here you hold it to your phone and it'll scan the nfc chip and suck in the data into your what we call the vault so we, our system will do some things on it. It'll check, do a face match check. It'll do OCR. If it's using, say, an accredited certification somewhere, it may sort of check the public key repository for that ID or something like that. What it then does is it takes the image and also all of the details associated with it, and we create a hash on the blockchain of that information. So we don't store that information on the blockchain. We don't encrypt it onto the blockchain or anything like that. We do a digital hash of it, like an MD5 or something like that. And it's like 128 bit representation of your ID and it's called asymmetric encryption. So it's one way, it's impossible to decrypt. The information's not on a chain, it's just a hash of it. So what that means is that when I'm say sharing my information with you, then you can actually check the hash on the blockchain to see whether or not I've changed that information. So that's where trust comes in. Even though it's self-sovereign and I have complete control over it, there is actually a mechanism to prove that I haven't edited it and to also follow the chain of custody of that identity. So we've got a mechanism in there. So when I share it with you, we can log that I've actually shared it with you. So if you have a leak, then I can always trace it back to you as well. So mm. there's that traceability that's included there. And that's with any document that you store within the vault. The data in the vault is encrypted with your seed phrase that's created when you first load the account that the vault can also be backed up to a secure drive or something like that so it means if someone gets access to that vault it's impossible for them to decrypt it unless they have your seed phrase so once again it's secure but we thought about a lot in this we thought about what happens if you lose your phone what happens if somebody steals it so the only way to access data in your vault you still need to use a biometric so your thumbprint or your face match with, within the phone and that also allows you to prove that it's you that's actually using that vault for an online transaction and not someone else so there's a huge amount of sort of edge cases that we've thought about in terms of accessing the vault storing the vault securing the vault using the vault and so on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you brought up W3C before, or you've used their standards? For the most part, we are. So within the storage of it and also the creation of the hash, we use a Merkle tree structure. So that sort of allows us to save on, well, to be a lot more efficient in the space, but also to be more efficient in how we do the hashing of the documents. And then in terms of the documents themselves in the metadata or the attributes associated that we use VC standard for that there, we're actually going back to verify in terms of the DI standard within W3C to make sure that we hundred percent allow for that. Part of the beauty of what we do is the storage of the information is secondary to the transmission of the information. And the reason why is because we can technically transmit that information in any standard that the end user needs through the bot query language. So if there's an organization that requires receipt of that information in VC standard, then it can be transmitted into whatever standard they want as well. So it's designed to be flexible in that manner. Who pays? So there's gas in order for any transaction to be, so for me to upload into the vault and yep. who's paying for that? Payment of that was always secondary to the creation of the technology for us. And we've had a lot of interesting discussions over the last few months in terms of the payment 
of all that. So where we're at at the moment is we fund the creation of the digital ID itself. So if for the use of any technology, you need to look at where the barriers for entry are. And if we suddenly said, okay, to create this digital identity user, you need to pay for it. We've just created this artificial barrier that's not necessary. So we fund the creation of a digital identity and where we charge is for the utilization of our service to present that digital identity to someone else, right? So if it's a verifiable or not a verified credential, so it might be your email address or name, you can share that with anyone. It's free to use VQL. Someone can receive that information if you want to share it with them. We don't charge for that. Where we do charge is where there's an organization that uses our services to receive, say, a verified credential. So something where there's a hash that's been created on the blockchain for that credential. We'll charge for the receipt of that data. We've got this sort of long-term vision, though, of this whole idea of information as an asset where the user can effectively start charging for the sharing of their data as well or getting rewards for sharing their data. So it's something that we need to hit critical mass for before we start implementing it. But this whole view that... This data that I hold has some sort of intrinsic value associated with it. And then also, let's say a university that creates graduation certificates that go into the vault. The university could charge nothing to put it into the vault. But if you share it with someone, the university could actually charge for you sharing it with someone because it's IP that they've actually created. So this whole idea that this information can be worth something in the future and creating an open system where we effectively just take a cut of those sort of different transactions or interactions right. with that identity. Well, our data has so much value to it. And yeah, so absolutely. it makes me think of Brave Browser is yeah, probably the totally. use case that is most familiar to the most people, mm-hmm. which is where when you use the browser, you can get paid in Brave tokens for yeah. sharing your data and seeing certain ads. Is that sort of how you think about it or is it yeah i mean you could do something like that so you could basically you go into a shoe shop and they've got a qr at the front saying sign up to our mailing list you could scan that and receive 20 cents or 20 tokens or something like that for sharing that information Mm -hmm. so someone's effectively paying you to be able to advertise it's not a new idea there have been startups that have tried to start to say that to create a mail system where you pay to receive or you get paid to receive advertising and things like that so that's sort of like a pretty simple extreme example of it, but you could even do it in more sort of commercial sense where, you know, if I share my information with that 7-Eleven that we spoke about before, they give me a reward or a discount for actually using that technology to, to do that. So once again, my information is an asset where I can benefit from the sharing of that information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes so much sense. So one thing that I'm very curious about to get your opinion on is how this is all going to work with digital wallets. We use the term wallet. It's interesting that you chose the term vault for sharing vault, but we've seen those words be used interchangeable. Reddit calls it the vault in their case. Where do you see the future? Do you think that we will have one vault for identity and another for our crypto or our money and then another for our, our art? For another for membership passes, do you think it'll all be within one? That's a very good question. And I see a future where it can be one, okay. but I don't think it's possible. And it's got nothing to do with technology. It's got to do with the fact that we can't even get standards for cables correct in terms of plugs and things like that. It's one of those things that there's going to be too many opposing standards and attempts at doing this that it's going to be very very difficult to settle on one for everything there's a book by neil stevenson i can't remember what it's called basically within that book they've got that a similar concept of a single sort of storage mechanism for everything about yourself it's your payments it's your crypto it's your art everything about yourself and that's the different areas that's sort of stored on the cloud but it follows you around and every time you want to sort of say something about yourself or share something about yourself or pay for something you just access that to do it so I love that as a future vision. I just don't see, as I said, all these competing enterprises and competing technologies, I just don't see it as an easy thing to get towards. As I mentioned, the cable problem is a classic example. We came up with the vault because we sort of saw this idea of all of your information is currently stored in, say, a filing cabinet. So I put my passport in the filing cabinet, things like that. The word filing cabinet just seemed too old school. It didn't really make sense. So we thought, oh, is it like a safe? And it's not like a safe either because safe is more like I store my money and valuables in there. 
So we sort of saw like the vault is where often we store a lot of our personal information in like a bank vault sort of thing. And that's something that when we need it, we can grab it and use it. So that's sort of where we came up with the idea of the vault. I'd love to see it all, everything stored in there. The other part in terms of the vault is within our life, we take on different personas. Uh, So I've got my work persona, I've got my social sort of media persona, I've got my persona of who I am at home, who I am when I go traveling and things like that. So one of the things about this only share what you need to from the vault, it allows you to put on or have different personas and only share that part of the persona that you need to share for accessing that sort of thing at that point in time as well. At the moment, there's not really any technology that allows you to have these sort of different personas in these different environments. Very interesting. And wouldn't it be so nice if there was just one vault that held everything? But like you said, for so many reasons, it just won't be possible. I mean, it's more likely that depending upon what use you are using, what company you're trying to connect with, what car service, what jurisdiction you live in, what passport you have, you will have a vault accordingly or a wallet according to what standard that company or organization or institution have decided to follow. How do we get sharing to infiltrate everything (laughs) to be the one that wins? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we need to be flexible. As you said, if car sharing company A requires something to be stored in a standard, you could still use the sharing vault and transmit to car sharing A in their standard, right? So that's the ability of, you know, the vault to sort of be able to sit in the middle of it and be able to sort of follow the very standards that these other companies sort of have. And I think that's the power that we have in terms of being able to sort of sit in the middle of that and being the roll up of all of these sort of other sort of organizations or companies requirements as well. So you could have a car sharing company that has their own system and all that sort of stuff. And we could infiltrate that and say, well, car sharing company, we also want you to accept data from people that have got a vault. And then people can start using the vault to access theirs and they might still have their own app, but eventually we may have more people accessing their system with the vault and they move over to that. It's so interesting to think about not just building the tech, but the steps that need to happen in order for it to become part of our everyday lives and for us to use it. Do you see people right now setting up vaults on their own without they're going to an event or they need it? Yeah. Or is there interest in that? I think we've got about 15,000 active users, but a lot of those do it because they're sort of staking or using the crypto side of things. So you've got a lot of people who sign up for that. But then since we launched sort of the VQL vault query language as an alpha, the website, we've had a lot of signups. A lot of people sign up just to play with that. So there's been a lot of uptake just to sort of see how it works and play with it and things like that. So far, the feedback that we've released, received of that, and it's only been out in the wild for a couple of weeks, but the feedback we've received of that is, is absolutely incredible. So people are saying, hey, I can use it in this, or my company would love to use this or things like that. So the best thing we did was release that as an alpha. We did release a version of the vault what we call the basic identity so you don't do any identity stuff you just create the vault which then allows you to put your own documents in it so we do see i'd say about 20 percent of people signed up and done that but they haven't been able to use it with anything yet and that's sort of where the next step is now we've got a great user base in terms of people that can test it with us and we're starting to release it like there's one invite only beta that we're releasing shortly, which is really just a very simple mechanism to trial some things you can do with the vault. It's a password manager. So like, you know, last pass, one password, dash lane, and it's simply a Chrome plugin. And I love this, what we've done. So basically the ability to store any of your passports or private information in the vault. So my username and password and a Chrome plugin that will search for email and password or username and password. And it puts a little sharing logo next to it. You click on it and it'll pop up a QR code. You scan the QR code with your phone and it'll securely transmit your email address and password to that website and log you in. So it means you don't need to remember those. But what we've done is created a purely self-sovereign version of a password manager. So it means that you're not storing it on a, so your passwords on a central server. No matter how secure they say it is, you still don't want your passwords on a central server. We all know the hacks that happened at the start or the end of last year at the start of this year with one of those companies. And the beauty of what we've done is the QR that pops up on the screen actually has a encryption code in there so that when I scan it, my data is sent using the encryption code that that QR tells my phone to send it as. So it means we've removed any man in the middle attacks, 
hundred percent secure from me to that website to log me in. And it means I can go to shared computers and all that sort of stuff. And I've always got my passwords here. I can just sort of QR code scan, log in and so on. So for us, that's just like a fun little alpha that just demonstrates some of the power of what you can actually do with the vault. It's amazing. It's incredible what happens, as you said, when you put something out there and you see what users do with it, what builders do with it. Curious for a few things. One is you mentioned hackathons that you guys are doing. Where are you going to be doing that? How can people find out and participate? This is like a pilot hackathon, a proof of concept hackathon. So we are running one that's sort of underway now in Vietnam. So basically the target for this is mostly sort of students inside the universities in Ho Chi Minh City. So we launched it about a week ago. We've got 10 applicants already. So 10 teams that have applied to basically enter which we've already hit our target for that there. And we'll shortlist a few of the teams and then they'll come to our office next month to basically be part of a 48 or 72 hour hackathon to just build identity solutions on our chain, mm-hmm. either using uh, Rust smart contracts or using the vault or the SDK or something like that. So they're pretty flexible how they do it. Based on the success of that, we will be running others around the world following that. So We've been invited to participate in one, co-sponsor one using our technology in Europe in the middle of the year. So we're in discussions about that one. And then we're in sort of discussions with a couple of other companies that specialize in helping to run these things to run a few this year as well. So we will be posting more and more information about that as it comes up. Great. And from a user perspective, or I guess the other, from a business perspective, how can business leaders listening to the show or users who want to get their vault, where can they go? How can they find that out? Yeah, just contact us throughout our website, sharing.network. So basically, if you come to our website, contact us there. We are doing a revamp of the website to sort of outline the business solution side a little bit more because it's very, very sort of crypto slash blockchain focused at the moment. But as we sort of launch that over the next few weeks, it'll be more obvious about where our target area is. But anyone that sees this that's interested in using Vault Query language, using our SDKs, or has some ideas of how to work with us, just please contact us through our website. Fantastic. All right, before we wrap, I want to ask you a couple of speed round questions. What's your favorite AI or Web3 tool? <laughs> Can't say sharing Vault. Favorite AI at the moment is ChatGPT, and it's only because it's just really, really fun to interact with. So I've I've been following these Reddit channels about how people are kind of hacking it, like allowing it to bypass its core rules. And I've been doing that myself and it's so much fun. So it's sort of stuff to pass time. But I also love the fact that you can use it to write code, to (laughs) review code. Definitely chat GPG. I love what Bing is doing with it though. So I've got access to their pre-release in Mm -hmm. terms of actually overlaying a more of a persona over it. And Mm -hmm. it's been interesting so far. That's really cool. Can we see that? Okay, one prediction for 2023 within Web3. Wow. So Web3 predictions, everything's going to moon. No. So, I, I think I, <laughs> And this is just purely just from our own self-interest, but I think that identity is going to become more and more important within Web3, but in terms of zero knowledge type stuff. Yeah. So, you know, AML and things like that. I think that that's going to be an absolute essential to bring the institutions and the retailers and bring trust back into that sort of environment. Yeah, I think that ZK, to me, I think it's going to be the breakout tech of the year that we're going to move from A, there's so many chains that are coming out with ZK right now and it's happening. And B, I think there's going to be an understanding from the user side and the business side of, okay, we understand ZK, we understand the value. This is what we've been waiting for. Let's go start to use it. So I completely agree. Yeah, I think ZK is essential to keep facilitating decentralization, right? Because mm-hmm. the other solution is centralization. Obviously the last thing that we want. We all know where that goes. Okay, last question. This is a tough one. So if you need to get a minute to think about it, if you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? What would I write on it? Own your data, take back control, own your data. Self-custody is the way to go. I love it. It's funny how there's sort of a few different styles that people take with that question. Some take the marketing and would just say, you know, sharing.network and just put your URL in there. (laughs) Others take the more philosophical approach, which usually revolves around being vulnerable, knowing yourself, you know, Mm. community, loving yourself. What's interesting about what you're saying is yours is sort of the same philosophical side, 
but in the digital way of data, which not enough of us really understand. It's so important for us to understand. So Tim, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for being a leader in the space. Really appreciate everything you're doing. Great questions. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. If it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.